My name is Esther Meyer Wagner. I am the executive director of the Gold Institute, and I would like to welcome you to this fourth seminar of our webinar series, Binging Religion. It's, uh, I can see again a few people who have been to the past seminars, and uh, we're also welcoming our uh, Facebook audience who watch live on Facebook. Um, and for those of you who are not yet uh, familiar with these webinars and not familiar with the Wolf Institute, we are a research institute focusing on religion and society, and we combine our research with teaching, with public education and the policy work to foster understanding between people of different beliefs and none. Um, there has been a rise uh, in programs on Netflix which focus on religious communities and this caught our attention. Uh, in the past webinars, we've talked about unorthodox, we've talked about the two popes, we've talked about Messiah. Uh, and today, um, we want to talk about Stiesel. Stiesel is a Israeli television drama that follows the Stiesel family, led by patriarch and rabbi Shulam Stiesel. Uh, and the series portrays their lives in a religious neighborhood in Jerusalem. The series is not brand new. It uh, was already uh, produced in 2013 but it has now been made available to larger audiences uh, because it was added to Netflix. So a lot of people uh, in the UK, uh, but as far as I understand, also in Israel have been able to actually revisit the series and it has become uh, very popular because it coincided with the lockdown. And we're very, very pleased uh, to virtually welcome our two speakers today. The first is Dr. Yaron Pelek, who some of you will already know from the series. Uh, Yaron joins us for a second time because um, he, he, he was also there when we talked about unorthodox a few weeks ago. Yaron is a fellow of Jesus College and the Kennedy Lee Reader in Modern Hebrew Studies in the, at the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies, University of Cambridge, and we're very happy to have you back today, Yaron. Thank and you. I'd also like to welcome our second speaker, uh, who is uh, Elisheva Malkil-Rosen. Elisheva is uh, an alumna of our MPhil program. In fact, she was actually in the very first batch of students. I remember very, very fondly that first year where Elisheva uh, was our MPhil student here with us. And uh, her research examined religious Judaism and peace activism in Israel. Elisheva is the former Jewish chaplain at the University of Cambridge, and she's now the Strengthening Women in Leadership Director at the Nishmat Center. Welcome to both of you. Um, each speaker, again, in the, uh, uh, each speaker will uh, present in the customary six-minute slots that we have for these webinars, and then we'll have a, a, a Q&A session afterwards. You can type in your questions in the Q&A session um, uh, below. We'll also sort of monitor Facebook and hope to be able to copy uh, the questions on Facebook onto the Q&As uh, in the webinar style. So uh, I think Yaron will start, and I'm handing over to you for a short summary of, uh, of, of Stiesel and your impressions of Stiesel and uh, what do you think it's done for the community? All right, thank you Miriam very much for having me and uh, hello to all the other participants. I, I want to start with um, saying a few things about the program which is the probably the, 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 the first uh, the first popular television programs about <clears throat> the Orthodox a community in Israel, a television series that were ever, ever broadcast in Israel. Israeli cinema had a lot of, not a lot, but a fair number of films uh, dedicated to uh, religious themes, not so many to orthodox themes, uh, themes uh, but very few television programs uh, about this community. And the uh, 2013 series, Stissel, is a unique uh, show in that it is the first one to uh, popularly uh, present the Orthodox community on uh, Israeli uh, screen on Israeli screens and to Israeli audiences. Um, as some of you probably know, the um, uh, the, the um, participation of uh, Orthodox communities in Israeli body culture and politics, so culture really is not very was not traditionally very uh, active and they were sort of uh, not part of cultural life in Israel for, for many, many years, for most of the uh, 20th century. Uh, they participated in politics, but not in, um, in the artistic scene, in the cultural scene, keeping to themselves. And uh, the show from this perspective is uh, revolutionary in that it brings, brought this community into na uh, national cultural focus. 
and uh, changed uh, the perception or continues to change the perception of the Orthodox community in Israel and now beyond because it's a very popular Netflix series. The show, interestingly enough, has another first in that the Orthodox community in Israel is not generally exposed to, uh, pro, uh, uh, to um, popular television programs. And this has been one of the first shows that was, that also made inroads into that community. And there was an interesting article a few years ago in the Israeli press about that phenomenon where you have Orthodox people tuning in to uh, look at the show, to watch the show and, uh, under, uh, and see how, um, how well the producers got it. That is producing the authentic, the community authentically, presenting it authentically. And uh, they had uh, little competitions going uh, uh, between them to discover the mistakes that people would be making in either speech and pronunciations and references to things because the, the actors, of course, are not orthodox and the, um, the writers do come from that community, but uh, not the, uh, the actors. And um, uh, it's from that perspective has uh, made a, a real impact on Israeli culture and art uh, and uh, presented the religious for the first time. Uh, and it also gave, gave um, uh, it, it was the first, it, the show opened the door to other shows after the show was produced very successfully. Uh, other shows followed suit and, um, presented more nuanced versions of uh, the Orthodox community, making it really, again, I'm saying this, I think for the third time, because it's very important, making it a legitimate and uh, active participant in, in Israeli uh, cultural life. And from this perspective, it is a unique show um, that is now also broadcast to the rest of the world and is, un I understand, very, very popular on Netflix. This is more or less what I wanted to say, uh, and I, I think maybe um, Elisheva can uh, pick up on that and add some stuff that I didn't cover from, I wanted to, to, to focus on the historical significance of the show in uh, the history of Israeli culture and um, Israeli television and arts. Thank you, Ron. Yeah, Ron. Um, Elisheva, I'm handing over to you. Okay, thank you. It's so nice to be here. Hi, everyone. Um, so um, I think that it is very clear, Yaron is very right, that the, this series has been widely accepted um, in Israel to a surprising degree. I mean, I've looked through many articles and spoken to many people about it, and uh, really you can see people from so many different communities who have watched the whole thing, um, and, and really love it. And, and I want to talk a bit about the, why I think it worked so well. Um, and first about what, um, how, how important that is, what, 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 what big significance that has in, in Israel. So, so as many people know, the, there's a very complicated um, relationship between, I would say, let's say the Haredi, the ultra-Orthodox community in Israel, and more secular community. Um, there is a lot of tension around a few different um, areas. Uh, one would be the army, that in Israel you have to go to the army and most of the Haredi ultra-Orthodox community don't go. The other would be that there would be claims that they don't work, that they're living off other taxpayers' money um, and religious coercion. So in general, there is a lot of tension. And also just simply, Lots of people um, never meet someone from the other community in Israel. It doesn't happen um, so often. The, the, the ultra-Orthodox community on the whole um, is quite good about keeping itself um, together and quite closed off very often. Um, and the, people just don't know each other. So there aren't so many places where you could break the stigma. Um, what's good is that um, people have television or at least internet. Um, and that way there is a, like a window for um, a, a, a somebody who is secular to see, to look into the Haredi world and 
through the internet, even though we usually say that most Haredi people don't use the internet, but there are ways um, to get into it and see how we are portrayed. Um, so we know that, um, so, so, I'm, so firstly, I think that it is so important um, that this series was so successful. And I think that it makes a very big difference um, for people to, to, see it, to, to see it and be influenced by it. Um, so as I said, it, what, it is very successful. I mean, it was a few years ago, as Miriam said. So in Israel, people saw it maybe a few years back. Um, and although there is, there, some people say that parts of it are a bit exaggerated, some of the romantic scenes are a bit exaggerated, couldn't really, really happen. But on the whole, it was very successful. I think there's a few reasons. Firstly, I think um, it's just good television. Like the, it's very artistic, it's very gentle. Um, it's just really beautifully made uh, without connection to what community it's talking about. So firstly, I think that's important. Um, and secondly, maybe the, the main thing that most people that would say is the reason that they enjoyed it so much is because uh, the, the people, uh, um, the, the characters are very relatable. They're really dealing with the exact same issues that everyone deals with, no matter what community you're from. Romantic relationships, complexity in marriage, relationships between children and parents, um, growing old, death, self-search finding your place in your community, in the world, mourning over lost ones, um, yearning and longing for someone or something that you once had, sibling rivalry, et cetera, et cetera. So these are um, things that all humans deal with. Um, and that's the main uh, thing that happens during the series. Um, someone I spoke to said it was the first time that she didn't see them as penguins, okay? So penguins, because they're wearing black and white. So it would be the first time that I actually saw beyond that um, and she said she thought it was strong because they weren't portrayed as the outsider to Israeli society. It was very clear that they are part of Israeli society. Um, so they're just portrayed as normal people with normal feelings and conflicts that any human has. Um, as someone said to me, it's a series about people who are also ultra-Orthodox. Um, and, and Akiva, he is so sweet, he's gentle, he's an artist, he's a bit of a, what we would call in Yiddish, like schlumper, he's a bit sloppy, he's not successful, he gets everything wrong, um, you know, he can't get his act together, and he's falling for the one women all the time, but he's so sweet and human, and you just love him, and I think that's such a success, that you just, you just love the person for who he is, and not what community he's from. Um, the second thing I think is that when they do deal with disturbing or challenging issues, they succeed in making all sides relatable. So you have, you finish uh, uh, the scene and you have compassion for them, for both sides. You can understand both sides' pain and you don't feel like you finish the scene with a lot of criticism, rather more understanding everyone. Um, um, so, so, um, um, sorry, I'm so um, for example, you have this, this terrible stage of, of uh, Gitti and Lipa's marriage when Lipa's in Argentina um, and then he comes back and she doesn't want to talk about it. She says it, nothing happened and, and you really feel ev everybody's pain. You can, you can really understand both sides um, and I think that's, that's really incredible that you finish difficult scenes um, with, with compassion. Um, I would say that probably that's where um, it's probably the opposite of unorthodox, whereas in unorthodox, there is, you feel a lot of criticism, right? You know that there's, it's kind of like bubbling in your tummy, whereas here you don't, you don't end the scenes feeling criticism, you feel compassion and understanding. And I think that even when, he de when they deal with issues that are very much from inside the religious world and that somebody living in a secular community would not uh, naturally connect to, uh, somehow they, they succeed making it seem beautiful, uh, even if you don't share the belief. And I really think that that is, um, I think it's all this beauty is due besides the talent and hard work of both of the creators, also connected um, to the fact that Jonathan Indorsky, the creator, 
himself, um, he grew up in an ultra-Orthodox community and he doesn't live in that community today. And I think you can really feel his, his love, his appreciation and longing for a world that he grew up in. In many ways, he left. And he's not c coming to like arrange a, a trial with the world that he left or criticize or deal with the things that pushed him away. He's coming and, and you really feel that respect and love and longing for the world that he no, no longer can be part of. And I think that really comes through in the amazing acting and the amazing script that you just feel the compassion and longing for something very human. Thank you, Alicia. But I think Yaron said he wanted to add something to what he said uh, uh, already. Yes, I, I wanted to, I made a, uh, note uh, to uh, talk about this before, and I'm very glad that Elisheva brought this uh, about the nature and character of the show and the relatability of the show. And I actually want—I actually want to try and perhaps puncture this um, very uh, rose-colored bubble that you painted, Elisheva, about the orth orthodox world that's painted there, because I'm wondering to myself. To what extent this is uh, true to the lives of these people because there seems to be a, and, and you really emphasize it in the way that you describe it as relatable, as these are ordinary people. But in fact, if you look at it from a historical perspective, you see that the many, um, uh, many um, elements from uh, liberal, bourgeois, unorth I mean, uh, uh, secular culture are promoted in the show, um, such as, for example, romantic love and self-fulfillment, which is, again, I, I, I don't know whether it's true or not because I'm not familiar with the Orthodox community. I'm not saying it's not like that, but I am saying that from the perspective of someone who, um, uh, from the perspective of a film historian, there is, perhaps a little bit too much emphasis on how normal they are and how ordinary they are and how relatable they are by um, emphasizing all of these values that uh, the majority of uh, unorthodox, not religious moviegoers are used to. And in this respect, I think there is a very interesting common denominator between Schissel and other shows, not just television shows, but also films in Israel, in which very, uh, in, uh, 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 many films that deal with the religious world in Israel are romantic comedies, films that are feel good films. And in some respects, I think there is, if you look at them one next to the other, it's somehow, it's too good to be true in a way, or too uh, peculiar. And you think to yourself, are these creators, are these orthodox creators, most of whom have grown up in the world, that's why the shows are so authentic, because they know this very, very, uh, I mean, f firsthand. Um, are they trying a little too hard to present their communities to the outside world in a way that paints them as positive, relatable, etc., etc., and to what extent does it reflect life in these, these communities? I'm not, again, emphasizing, I don't know whether it's true or not, because I don't know these communities. But it sounds a little, a little bit too much um, uh, like placating. And in the case, for example, of a, um, these foundational films, Ushpizin uh, from 2004, I believe, uh, that was a, that was a uh, deliberate attempt by the creator of the film, Shuri Rand, wasn't the director, to, um, I, I, to sort of, uh, to, to make sort of public, uh, good public relations for his community uh, to the non-Orthodox public. He talks about this, he writes about this, he's very honest about it. Uh, so I'm wondering- Can, can I just cut in there, Yvonne? I mean, the the reason why um, you you go to the medium of romantic comedy is because you need to have some sort of uh, a topic that people can relate to, right? I mean, there are probably 
very few things that a secular audience can relate to in terms of you know sort of overlapping things with very very religious communities so of course if you go to love if you go to romantic comedies there is actually a basis and it's also a point of uh, a sort of controversy because very often these religious communities are seen as as not you know sort of engaging in romantic love so i think i'm just i'm just i'm just questioning the authenticity of it that's yes all. Yes. Okay. So we have a, a question from Catherine. You have already both uh, alluded to this, um, but she, she asks, how has the author of this community responded to the series or perceived the series? Perhaps you could go a little bit more into detail. What sort of reactions have people seen? You know, what sort of, um, how was the series basically advertised or like talked about in communities? Do, do you know anything about that? Sheva, do you want to uh, pick this up? Um, okay. Um, well, I'm not part of the ultra-Orthodox community either. Um, so, I mean, reacting to Yaron, I, I can't talk for the ultra-Orthodox community, but I think, first of all, probably the first thing to say is that there isn't a community. Eve, also, the ultra-Orthodox community has so many different sects and parts to it, and I'm sure that each sect um, has reacted differently. Um, there are for sure ultra-Orthodox people who would never watch it. Um, but I think on the whole, you can for sure say that this was probably the most successful series in terms of how many people from the ultra-Orthodox community would, uh, did watch it and enjoyed it. And I think that, they, that the reaction from what I've read about um, w was that fi finally, you know, we're portrayed in a way that is not so negative. But at the same time, they were saying about what you were saying, Yaron, that maybe some of the romantic scenes were, would like never have happened in a regular ultra-Orthodox family. Mm. Yes, yes. And I, uh, myself, um, I was um, looking at this uh, a few days ago, looking back at some of the um, research I've done and uh, pulled up an article from uh, the early um, 2010s about the, uh, and I mentioned it in my introduction, about how the Orthodox, members of the Orthodox community, I don't know how they did this because I understand that television is not very widely uh, sort of watched in that community, uh, but that there was uh, really sort of a scramble to watch the, chat, the uh, episodes as they were coming on to uh, follow it and see, again, I think it comes from this thirst to see yourself portrayed, um, you know, and, and, and um, delivered to a wider audience and sort of um, understood. And so I think generally, my understanding generally is that the reaction within the Orthodox community was very positive and um, elated in some respect. Yeah. yeah, I think that there really there is, are many ways to watch um, series and on online without having a television at home. So I think that was uh, widely used uh, while yeah. the while the series was coming out. But I I do want to say though that I think um, in terms of what Yaron was saying before, I think that uh, Indorsky himself, you know, says people think that this series is about love and relation and relation um, romantic relationships, but it's actually about longing and missing something and i think that it's it's uh, these relationships are part of their way to uh, it's something they're using in order to, to talk about things that we long for or people that we long for and how we search that in, in the world and 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 also i think that there are quite a few things uh that the series is very careful about keeping very very haredi very ultra orthodox in like the classic way of how we would look at them so how, let's say, Shalom Shtisel tries to convince his daughter Gitti not to divorce, right? He doesn't try to talk to her about what's disturbing her and, uh, uh, like, to really get down to it and then talk about the option of divorce. It's kind of very clear that's not an option. So that's very much how we would, you know, stigmatically look at the Haredi world and, and many things that are very, very, um, very much that community and not a secular community, if we can talk about stigma. Mm -hmm. Yes. You, know, you, another... talked about, you talked about television, and of course this is something that is also problematized, problematized 
rather serious. Um, when you, when, in the scenes with, with the Borba, with the grandmother, right, where she has a television and the various male family members try, you know, by different means to, to somehow cut her off the television and, and, yeah. and make her sort of a bad conscience about having a television in her room. Um, I found it really frustrating. Um, normally, when I watch a television series, I, I'm, I'm a big Googler. I always Google why certain actors are being cast, why uh, you know certain things happen in the show. It's actually quite difficult to do it with Stiesel because there is hardly anything out there. I think few people have watched it, probably sort of deterred by the subtitles. And, and there's very little uh, discussion. For example, why is the Boba actress just changed? Do you know that? <laughs> Did you talk about the way? She, she passed, passed away. away. Yes. Oh, right. Yes. Oh, that's quite tragic. I didn't know that. You see, um, I tried to find it, but I couldn't find but, it. Yeah, Miriam, you know, actress. You know, Miriam, I want to I want to pick up on your uh, comment on casting, and I think again, uh, I, to to emphasize what I said before, if you look at the casting you realize that they have chosen uh, a, a, a very attractive actor to play the young Stissel. Uh, and I think this is, in my opinion, it's done also for these kinds of visibility reasons and attraction reasons, uh, and as well as, you know, his, his love interest, um, you know, the divorced, the twice divorced um, woman he's in love with. Uh, she's also very, very attractive. And this is something relatively new for shows on uh, about the Orthodox world. If you look, for example, one of the first shows that, uh, that did it in 2007, um, A Touch Away, they only had one episode, I mean, one uh, season uh, that tried to um, speak about a dialogue between the Orthodox and the secular in Israel. They cast two very attractive uh, actors into the roles of the uh, the leads, and you have this here as well. You don't have this, for example, in a film like uh, Ushbizin that I mentioned before, where the middle-aged couple is not particularly attractive, and the emphasis really is on their faith and um, and, uh, and on their Hasidic community rather than on uh, something else. So you, you have also a tendency in these shows that try to showcase the Orthodox community on values, again, that would be deliberately attractive. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I'm just, I just think it's uh, important to note them and uh, to uh, try and understand what were some of the reasons behind them. Mm. Yeah, I think that I think in normal films, you also usually have attractive characters. I mean, it's it's, it's television, right? We want to be sold an illusion. We, I think we prefer to look uh, at a very attractive couple having romantic uh, feelings for one another than uh, not so attractive. It's, it's just sort of human nature, what we expect from people. Yes, yes, but, 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 uh, but uh, the Orthodox community is not about aesthetics. Uh, Orthodox religious Judaism is not about external aesthetics. That's not yes. a, a primary concern of theirs. And um, in this respect, when they do that, they, um, they, they, uh, it, 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 they show how they incorporate or buy into, or I mean, again, it's not that community, but it's not that community. It's a, it's a person that came out of that community and now doesn't belong to it. But that person is trying to uh, take these values and associate them, values that we hold central and we relate to, relate them to the Orthodox community that may, in fact, not subscribe to them. I think also that it's important to remember that, um, that the Haredi community is, part, is also living in the 21st century and they will never be totally disconnected from all the other values that everybody is talking about and, and changing within. So even if the change comes a bit slower, um, they're part of the world and they're going to be dealing with the same issues. I think um, that that's actually a very important thing to note that um, maybe that's part of what we're supposed to be understanding when we see them deal with this. But it's also interesting what you said about why a creator would do that. And I haven't spoken to Jonathan Indorsky in length about this or anything, but I think from what you, when you read about how he talks about the show, it does not seem to me that he was 
trying to portray things in a, in a positive light about his community. I don't think that was his agenda. Um, and I think that he was trying to just um, bring uh, feelings and something very human forward. That may very well be uh, the case, uh, but you know, we as viewers and critics, you know, are um, allowed to have our own opinions, uh, notwithstanding withstanding that of the creator. But and absolutely, you're absolutely right um, about what you said concerning the the enmeshment of or the uh, penetration of the Orthodox community or the the entry of the Orthodox community into the larger Israeli community. In Israel, which um, in which uh, you know it's a very it, it's a very small country and very um, populous country, and the separation that can happen, for example, uh, between or, uh, religious communities in the communities in the United States um, is is not, and for other reasons as well, is not the same in Israel, where the Orthodox community is growing and is progressively becoming part of Israeli society, not, I mean, on many, on many levels. And this is just one level that we see in this show, uh, both in the, uh, the themes that the show deals with, as well as the very fact that we visibly see them on a platform where they never were participants before. We have a, another question. I think it's, it's someone like me who, actually sort of can't Google the, 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 the themes uh, covered in the show and wants to know what is the deal with the scroll that they find and why is it called the baby? Is that something that's, that's lost in translation or could you just, you know, elaborate on what, what's actually happening there? I'm not sure what you're referring to. You know, that they find when they clear up one of the cupboards, they find the scroll and they call it the baby and this is the scroll that she that um, Shulam takes to the uh, son-in-law to have fixed and it can't be fixed and it's buried. But why, it's called, why is it called, in the English subtitles, it's called the baby? I'm, I, I'm, I have to say, I don't remember this, this particular. All right, Elisheva, do you remember this? Yeah, well, in Hebrew, it's also called the baby. And um, I, don't, I can't tell you for sure, I can tell you what I understood, is that usually the Torah scrolls are very large. They're very big and heavy. And then sometimes, they, they make small ones that are really, really small and they just look like a baby in comparison oh, right. to the big, heavy ones. Um, and if you would have one at home, which usually you wouldn't anyway, then it probably would be a smaller one. But in Cambridge, in the synagogue, there is a little baby one. You can go see it. All right. Well, that's very good to know. <laughs> um, we have a question from Mary. Um, she's asking, did the series result in any increased dialogue between the Orthodox or Alpha Orthodox or Ultra Orthodox communities and other societal groups? No, it has not. Um, but you know, I think uh, these dialogues are not conducted sort of officially by the two sides, you know, drawing and putting together delegations and meeting in, in conference conference halls and. Um, and, and, and um, doing this so officially, I think the dialogue that, that a show like that is um, inducing is more informal, like the one we're having now, as well as we mentioned another kind of dialogue, the uh, one in which the Orthodox community itself is sort of clandestinely or surreptitiously sort of watching the show and that's another kind of dialogue, if you think about it, because they are, uh, you know, they're exposed to a cultural product that is not made for them. It isn't made for them. It's made for another audience. But they're exposed to it, and they like it, and they incorporate some of its value, even if they don't, even if subconsciously. So the dialogue takes place on other levels. Um, and in, in, in smaller ways and sort of non-official ways, I would say. Mm. Is there ever any reaction against the obvious, sort of obvious anti-Zionism that is also portrayed by some of the characters? Does sort of the Israeli public react to this quite, quite strongly? Sheva? I think that part just fits 
perfectly into how anyway they're portrayed. It just works very well in that sense. Hmm. But I think also in terms of dialogue, I don't know if it increased dialogue, but I think the fact that for many secular people or religious who are not ultra orthodox, so any also people from my community who don't have much connection with the Haredi world, I think the fact that that people went through um, the process of watching and rethinking uh, about these issues is already a very important and significant step. Yeah, absolutely. I, I want to I wanna, uh, sort of emphasize this and repeat, and I say, I think that um, you, 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 Miriam, you mentioned the anti-Zionist aspect of um, the Haredi community, for example, in politics, it's kind of very, um, in a very silly way expressed in the way that uh, members of Knesset from uh, Haredi parties refuse to become ministers and they're sort of called under ministers. It's sort of like they don't recognize the state of Israel officially and they're only, they're, 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 they're want, they don't want the title, but they want, you know, something less than that so that um, they don't seem to be cooperating with the Zionist state. But in fact, uh, this kind of attitude of the Haredi community has been eroded to a very great extent and they are very much part, I think, Sheva, correct me if I'm wrong, very much part of Israeli society and um, become so, uh, become ever more so as the years go by. And I think the, the resistance to Israel becomes more and more nominal than anything else. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a, a, a question statement from uh, Ivan, who's a very uh, loyal uh, customer of, of these webinars. He writes, a predictable question, I think, about the limits of religion on film television. Elisheva nicely laid out her assessment of the program. Is it first uh, a well-made, uh, hang on, it is first a well-made television, second place on universal themes, third, it makes for empathic, uh, empathetic viewing, it moves people, that's all well and good. But are we looking then at the limits of religion on television and film? To what extent can television go into the more difficult questions? So, for example, that religion really is a strange thing in the West. It runs against the grain of secular culture. Does a television format too easily aim for mediation of difference, which does not allow us to delve with any depths into social thought lines in intra-religious uh, relations, for example? Um, I actually think that this is an excellent question and I think again it has to do with demography and with uh, the character of this community. I think as long as this community, the Haredi community stays separate culturally from the rest of Israeli society, the ability of shows about it to be created and be popular and um, continue is limited because they are to a great extent a curiosity and I think there is a limit to that I, I, I believe that there is a limit so right now in the current situation there's a limit to that curiosity and beyond a certain point I can't see how more shows are being made about this community. Um, but, you know, things may change. And as they become, if they become more incorporated into the culture at large, then, of course, that will change a pace. Elisheva, do you have something to add? I just, I think that it very much also depends on the aim of the creator and what he's trying to do. Um, and also, I think that there are uh, it's true that this is not the main theme, um, um, but there are very many places where you can really feel the, the religious struggle or the more traditional struggle, let's say with individualism, uh, when he's trying to figure out if he needs to give up his art or not. Um, that is, I think, for somebody living in such a closed community, that is a very big um, religious uh, um, dilemma. Um, and it is about how how connected I am to the outside modern secular world. So even if it's not the main issue, I think that a few times they touched on those kind of things. 
We have a comment, we have a question from uh, scholar Kino Kilo, who's joined us from Kenya. He says, this is a wonderful engagement. I can hear you clearly from Kenya. My question is whether many religious people like the show. I mean, you've touched on this already, but uh, uh, do you know whether there, there, are, sort of, there are little fan clubs uh, of, of Stiesel in, in the Orthodox communities? They love the show. It's love, like really, really love. Um, and I think that, that it, it's also cute because you can see there are a few websites of the like, ultra-Orthodox communities, like there's one called Khadri Khadarim. It would be called Khadri Khadarim. It's called Khadri Kharedim, which is like the rooms of the ultra-Orthodox people, whereas, uh, I mean, they're not supposed to even use internet, but there's like a website where they would chat about it. And then every time there was a word that people, that was unclear what it means in, in Yiddish or something, then there's like a, a, a whole um, dictionary, a shtisel dictionary, where you kind of, if you know Yiddish well, then you'll explain it. So yeah, there are many fans. Very good. Um, Mary is asking, how did Israeli media portray the series? So how, how was the critical write-up? Probably this is a question for you, Yaron, because this is something that you... It was very, very well received. It's one of these shows that has a, a critical acclaim as well as popularity. Um, for example, not that I'm making a comparison, but like The Sopranos. I was very, very highly acclaimed artistically as well as extremely popular. And Shjizl is just like, you know, Shjizl is the same. It's very, very popular as well as very... As well as very well appreciated as a show. It's very well made. And Dursky, that Elisheva mentioned, the, the creator of the show, is a very talented um, uh, director and um, very prolific. And um, to date, this has been his major work and he uh, is very, very impressive. Um, we have a follow-up question from Scholar Kilo. He, he asked not only about the perception in, within the Jewish religious community, he wonders whether people of other religions like and follow the show and what impact that does have in dialogue. Are you aware of any of these um, fan clubs of Diesel in other religions, in other religious communities? I, I have to say, I don't, I have to, I, about a week ago, I received an email from a retired film scholar in Canada who sent me a book long study of all the seasons of Shtisel, chap episode by episode analysis. I don't know what his religion is, but I was very impressed. And here you have, I think, a, uh, uh, you know, a, a very impressive expression of the popularity and the impact and the dissemination of the show. Elisheva, do you have anything to add or? I wonder, how, I wonder if any of our viewers know if the show is popular in, for example, Muslim communities anywhere in the world. Mm. Well, something we can investigate, my, maybe via our Facebook pages. Um, I don't know about other religions, but I can tell you that I read something cute that there's a point where um, Indulski and Elon, who are the creators, work with Said Kashua. Um, who is, um, I mean, I don't know, I don't know how he, uh, um, what he says about himself, but in, uh, I don't know, Hebrew Wikipedia, you would see Israeli Arabs. I, mean, I don't know if he calls himself Israeli Arab or Palestinian Arab, I don't know. Um, and he, he worked with them. And um, I think that it's very sweet to read about that connection because they talk about the fact that minorities understand each other. So in the very Haredi community in Jerusalem uh, uh, or um, in, in their um, uh, neighborhood. And in Beit Safafa, which is Israeli Arab neighborhood, there would be certain things that they would have in, in, um, connected that other people wouldn't understand. So for example, the teachers give out a little thing called bananit. It's kind of, I don't know, some kind of chocolate banana something that they give out the kids in the first, uh, um, in the beginning and and they laugh about that that there are some things that you can't buy in a regular supermarket but if you go to the these communities um, then you'll be able to find it so the only people who still eat those bananas would be either the ultra-orthodox communities in in uh, where they're living in 
their communities in Jerusalem or the Israeli Arabs in their communities. So I think that's a cute connection. Mm. I think I remember that Swede from East Germany. I think we had something similar there. <laughs> Israel always reminded me very much of East Germany, so it's not, not a surprise there, I must say. Um, I think we're coming almost to the end. We have maybe one more short question from Kitty. Do you think that the recent series Unorthodox was influenced by Stiesel? I, I, I don't think directly, but I, I do think that um, programming was probably influenced because these shows have had uh, quite... The, the, Netflix, uh, I think because of the popularity of Stiesel, perhaps um, were... I, I don't know this at all for a fact. I'm just, I'm just trying to guess. Um, that the popularity of, Sh of Stissel encouraged uh, Netflix to also invite or uh, program the uh, unorthodox as well. All right. Um, I think we're draw drawing to a close now. We're a little bit, a few minutes over over our time. Uh, so I would like to thank you very much again, Elisheva and everyone, for coming on board today. Uh, it was really wonderful. Mm -hmm have thank you with you us. So much. Um, and also again thank you all for being such a uh, such a wonderful uh, virtual audience for your interesting questions um, and uh, I'm also I also want to advertise the webinar next week so next week we'll we'll stop talking about uh, 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 television shows and it will delve right into Muslim cohesion in the UK we'll talk about Sunni uh, Shia relations and the seminar will take the webinar will take place on Thursday at 4 p.m. So I hope you'll join us again. And again, thank you uh, for the panel to the panelists. Thank you for the uh, for being a wonderful audience. And uh, see you next week. Bye bye. Thank you.